Hi, welcome everyone uh, to a special webinar, Innovations in Virtual Program Delivery and Lessons Learned Through COVID-19. We're very pleased uh, to have everyone in attendance today. Uh, this webinar has been facilitated by the Mid-America Regional Council, uh, designated Area Agency on Aging in the Kansas City Metropolitan Region, uh, the Kansas City Communities for All Ages Initiative, and in collaboration with the National Council on Aging and other partners. Uh, so again, welcome. Uh, we are very thrilled to have you here and hope that everyone walks away with some key learnings. Uh, you know, in, in periods of crisis, uh, there's always rapid change that occurs, um, and that change can lead to excellent outcomes uh, for program delivery and how we engage older people uh, as we try to remain uh, adaptable and resilient in the face of challenges. Um, and across the country, we've observed that program providers and aging and adult services have really risen to this challenge, try to remain uh, in, in connection with their clients and really innovating what they offer and how they offer it uh, to make sure that people are still receiving services. Today, our presenters will make sense of a chaotic programming environment um, and really outline a response and shift to virtual uh, that has made a, the COVID-19 environment much more doable for the clients that we serve. That response was facilitated by uh, collaboration and resource sharing that's a pretty constant uh, in the aging and disability network. Um, and it allowed us to maintain pivotal, pivotal and critical connections to vulnerable populations throughout this period. They'll also highlight how what was accomplished in the last six months will really deepen the impact of our programming into the future, uh, probably for decades to come. The changes that we've made now, adaptations that we've made now will continue on. Uh, so we really think that this training uh, will be applicable to any entity that's currently offering program to older adults and individuals with disabilities, and also those who are thinking about doing so, and perhaps thinking about doing so in a new way. Um, I, I do want to take a moment to introduce myself, uh, just so you're familiar. I'll be uh, hosting the questions at the end. Uh, I'm James Stowe. I work for the Mid-America Regional Council, um, it, which is an area agency on aging. And we have a stellar lineup of presenters today who I'll introduce uh, more in just a moment. But first, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, at the end, we'll have time for questions with the panelists uh, and presenters. So if you would look over at your tab uh, on the GoToWebinar uh, Control Center, and look at the questions tab. And if you expand that, that is where you'll type questions for the presenters and panelists at the end. Uh, so if you want, if you have a question that comes up during that time, go ahead and type it there. And if you want to chat during the presentation amongst one another, which we would encourage and, and keep the uh, communication going, go ahead down to the chat tab. And that's where you'll uh, be able to type in uh, comments to your colleagues who are watching um, during the presentations. But we'll save those questions for the end um, that are put in the question box and we'll try to let people um, get to those as they can. Uh, so now to introduce our uh, star lineup of presenters, um, I would like to start with uh, Katie Zuki. Um, she has an MPH and she's a senior program manager with NCOA's Center for Healthy Aging since 2015. In this role, she works collaboratively with community-based partners across the country to identify, implement, and sustain evidence-based programs that support older adults in staying well and aging in the community. These programs include chronic disease self-management education, falls prevention, and behavioral health. She has a master's degree in public health from Hunter College and a bachelor's degree in psychology from St. Mary's College of Maryland. Uh, so we're very happy to have Katie on. Next, we have Tane Lewis. Um, she is the evidence-based program coordinator for the Department of Aging and Adult Services at the Mid-America Regional Council here in Kansas City. And additionally, she is a local project coordinator for the Missouri Association of Area Agencies on Aging, ACL Chronic Disease Self-Management Education Grant. Um, she's also a master trainer and leader of chronic disease self-management education programs and a designated community health worker. In her role at MARC, Lewis is building a regional network of community-based organizations committed to facilitating evidence-based programs that empower our community through health promotion, disease prevention education, and support services. And Lewis earned her Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from the University of Kansas. And last but not least, Victoria Jackson is the Health and Wellness Coordinator for the Liberty Parks and Recreation Department, a municipality in Missouri. She is a master trainer and leader uh, for the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program, 
workplace CVSMP, chronic pain self-management program, and a leader for Walk With Ease and Active Living Every Day. Jackson earned a Bachelor of Science in Health Studies and Community Health and a Master's in Nutrition from the University of Central Missouri. She is committed to creating a healthier community by fostering community connections and providing quality health and wellness programs and services. Uh, so I'd like to welcome all of our panelists. Thank you for joining us today. And we are going to kick it off with a presentation by Katie Zuki. So Katie, please go ahead. Thank you so much, James, and thank you to the Mid-America Regional Council for the opportunity to present today and share a little bit about what we've learned so far about virtual evidence-based programs. My name is Katie Zuki. I'm from the National Council on Aging. We're located right outside of Washington, D.C., and have the vision of creating a just and caring society where we all have the opportunity to live with dignity, purpose, and security. I work specifically with NCOA Center for Healthy Aging, where we have the goal of increasing the quality and years of healthy life for older adults and adults with disabilities. We're funded by the Administration for Community Living to operate two national resource centers, one focused on evidence-based chronic disease self-management education programs and the other on falls prevention programs. And we also do a lot of work around other areas of healthy aging, like behavioral health, physical activities, vaccinations, and oral health. So ultimately, our two resource centers are here to support you, and that's ev any organization that is implementing evidence-based programs across the country. Uh, we specifically provide technical assistance to organizations that are funded by the Administration for Community Living to implement these types of programs, and that includes 44 CDSME and falls prevention grantees in 30 states. Um, but this information, these activities are open to any organization that is doing this work. And that includes one-on-one -on -one support to talk through successes or challenges, networking and peer learning, including work groups, learning collaboratives to focus on more complex sustainability strategies, and a listserv of professionals to talk about different resources and share what's happening in your community. We also develop many online tools and resources, including ongoing webinars, and compile best practices from organizations across the country um, in what they've developed so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And we also operate two national databases to collect both participant and workshop level information on chronic disease self-management education and falls prevention programs, which is a great asset in order to advocate for the continued funding of these programs across the country. So a little bit of a snapshot of older adults that have been served nationwide by chronic disease self-management education programs um, based on the data we've collected through our database since 2010, more than 417,000 individuals have gone through CDSME programs. Over 300,000 individuals have completed those programs. And a little bit of demographics, which should look familiar to those of you that are implementing these programs. Uh, in general, individual participants are on average uh, about 66 years old, majority are female, about half live alone, 16% um, report having a disability, and 11% indicate that they're a caregiver, um, and most frequently they're reporting having hypertension, arthritis, or diabetes, um, with the average number of chronic conditions reported per person being about two and a half. Um, following participation in a CDSME program, on average, individuals say that they would rate their confidence in managing a chronic condition to be about an eight on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the most confident. And similarly, for falls prevention programs, over 118,000 participants have attended these programs since 2014. Generally, falls prevention participants tend to be a little bit older than those attending chronic disease self-management education workshops. About 80% are female. Similarly, half live alone. Um, about 35% report having a disability and most frequently report having arthritis, heart disease, diabetes, and other not identified chronic conditions. 
So we've been implementing these in-person evidence-based programs for many years, and we all encountered the mass challenge in March 2020 of contemplating how to move these from virtual. So this data on this slide shows the change in program implementation from 2019 to 2020 over the same period of March to May. You'll see that there was a drastic decrease in program implementation um, as scheduled workshops were canceled across the country. And this really represented a loss of these evidence-based programs that provide peer connection, support in managing chronic conditions, and physical activity opportunities. So organizations across the country were faced with the need to decide if uh, they were going to implement these programs virtually, how to do that, and how to really reinvent uh, what this looks like entirely. So the first step in that process is really identifying what's possible. With most of these programs being implemented in person, it was necessary to figure out whether it was even allowed to implement them online. And so each evidence-based program has their own set of guidance for how to proceed with virtual delivery. Um, some programs have been approved for remote delivery, others have not. And NCOA is tracking this information on the page linked here. So this has uh, guidance on all programs that have provided information on whether uh, they are allowed to be implemented remotely, uh, if they are included on the approved list of programs for Older Americans Act Title 3D funding. So this will give you information on how to implement those programs as well as whether training is available online and I encourage you to check this pro program page frequently for updates as this is continuing to be something that changes on an ongoing basis and we will continue to add information here. So to give you a snapshot of what is allowable for different types of programs, um, many organizations are implementing the Self-Management Resource Center's Chronic Disease Self-Management Education Suite of programs. And there are a few options that um, have been offered for implementing these programs remotely. The first is the online Better Choices, Better Health program that is uh, coordinated by Canary Health. This is an asynchronous implementation of the CDSME program. So that means people could go on anytime they want throughout the week and complete the activities for the program. Um, the second option is to transition those in-person workshops to video conference, anything like Zoom, GoToMeeting, um, any type of video conference software like that. That could be used for any of the curricula that are listed here. Um, and that is a synchronous option. So everybody logs on at the same on the same day at the same time to go through the curriculum with leaders together. And then the third option is mail toolkits. And these toolkits were originally developed for individuals to move through on their own. Um, and during the pandemic, um, another option was offered that you could mail someone a toolkit and also schedule weekly phone contact with small groups to walk through some of the content. And that is now available for chronic disease, chronic pain, diabetes, self-management, as well as the Spanish versions of those programs. This is a list of the programs that are always or temporarily allowable remotely, either by mail, phone, or video conference for behavioral health, caregiver support, and other chronic disease self-management programs. More information is available at these links if you want to learn more. Similarly, these programs are always or temporarily allowable remotely for falls prevention, nutrition, and physical activity. This list in particular is one that will, I expect will continue to change as uh, pilots are currently in progress for additional programs that will be uh, having guidance to be offered remotely. So keep an eye on, out on this list, especially if there are programs that um, have not been allowed yet, they might be added soon. 
So all of this, uh, to take that information on what is allowable and then actually operationalize that into how programs can be implemented virtually in the community has taken a lot of innovation from community-based organizations across the country. And that's really reinventing every single step of the process from outreach and recruitment to data collection to getting individuals onto the video conference or onto the phone call um, to conducting the workshop and how and what that looks like and then following up for additional information afterwards. And so we're tracking some of those program updates from organizations that are funded by the Administration for Community Living at the link on this slide to share some of the information for how that's going across the country. Countless resources have been developed during this time uh, from guides for how to implement these workshops for leaders to instructions for accessing workshops through Zoom to online program forms. And we're continuing to share those um, for others across the country to adapt to their specific locations. So ultimately, we're only seven months into this process, but it's happening. So workshops are being offered by video conference, by telephone, by Facebook Live broadcast, by mailed programs, information's being collected through online data collection forms. Um, and this is a lot of options, a lot of work, a lot of effort into reframing all of these processes, ultimately to make sure that uh, older adults in our communities have the connection and support that they need to move through this difficult time. And we're seeing that programs are in increasingly being offered and the data is increasingly being collected and reported back to our workshop. So this is a snapshot just of the chronic disease self-management programs from our database, but you could see March and April had very uh, low, if not any, workshops at all as everyone was really in the planning um, mitigation phase of what to do next. Uh, and then over the summer, the number of remote workshops that were reported really shot up. We expect that that's true for September as well, that this data was pulled just halfway through the month. Uh, so organizations are already really ramping up implementation to be able to uh, serve more older adults remotely. So now I'm gonna walk through a few successful strategies that we've seen in different areas of program implementation while these strategies have been collected specific to these health promotion evidence-based programs. Um, I expect that many of them are also applicable to offering different types of virtual programs um, more generally as well. Uh, so specific to outreach and recruitment, we've heard you know, a few different camps on this. Um, one is that organizations have continued with many of the outreach methods that worked prior to the pandemic. So instead of promoting a workshop that's in person at a specific location, they've continued using some of those reliable methods to promote a workshop that is online at a specific time or by telephone at a specific time. So um, if it was successful prior, many are finding that that's still a good way to find individuals during the pandemic. Um, some of those include social media ads. Uh, one benefit of the social media ads is that that could link directly to a sign-up page for an online program, which may make the um, sign-up process more smooth. Uh, other formats we've heard of are newspaper ads, email newsletters, using waiting lists from in-person implementation. So if someone signed up um, last fall, maybe they're still interested in this alternative format. Um, also uh, continuing to foster partnerships with healthcare providers for referrals continues to be important, especially right now as healthcare providers are able to um, have less in-person contact with individuals. They might be more motivated to refer to these programs that can continue to support people while they can't come to the office. Um, we are also seeing new opportunities to reach broader geographic areas with workshops. So while it used to be that you might be uh, promoting a workshop for a specific, you know, uh, 30 mile radius, whatever that may be for your area, 
um, now you could really promote a workshop for the entire state and that's accessible because it's all online. Um, and uh, the other challenge that we didn't have with in-person recruitment is really the idea of triaging what kind of format is going to work best. And this is something that we anticipate will stay long-term um, depending on whether somebody has access to technology or internet. Uh, it will depend on whether they can attend by video conference. If they do not, then mail or phone might be the best option. Um, and in some places, they're starting to host very limited in-person options with social distancing and protective measures in place, um, but really figuring out what is best for that person and what they have access to. So having a menu of options is useful. Uh, next, a few thoughts on data collection. Largely before programs went remote, data collection was implemented in person using paper forms when somebody arrived at the workshop and the leader was really able to spend time walking through that process with participants. Um, now that largely has to be done either online or by phone. Um, so if you're conducting data collection online, best to consider using a HIPAA compliant form um, something like JotForm or Sur SurveyGizmo, and I'm sure there are others out there that I don't know about yet. Um, some organizations are mailing data collection forms to individuals with postage to return them. Um, others are mailing forms to individuals just for reference and then calling each participant to walk through collecting that information by phone and a staff member would then take the data, enter it into the online system, whether that's directly into a database or into an online uh, data collection form. So that's two different options for using the mail and phone. We're hearing that more follow-up is needed than before to ensure that these, any pre or post surveys you're completing for really any activity are completed. Um, you just don't have that face time to sit down and say this is the time to complete the data collection form. So a little bit more, um, more additional reminders and follow up to make sure that people take the time to do it if they choose to. And then uh, another new part of this is figuring out a process to transfer data collected from paper forms or the online survey to the necessary databases where it needs to go. Um, and then technology access and education. This is really an entirely new part of implementing these programs that never existed before and I think comes with a lot of strong benefits. Um, so some uh, recommendations that we're hearing from organizations doing this work are to schedule a session zero and that is an orientation session before the actual program begins. So if you have a a 10 session program, this would be a session that's added before those 10 sessions to introduce the workshop, what's going to happen, what type of activities occur, and importantly now to address any technology related questions. We've heard that these session zeros are being implemented both as a group, so get everybody on and walk through uh, issues together, or individually, so holding these as one-on-one -on -one calls to make sure that everyone can actually get on the video conference. And that will likely depend on, you know, how many concerns you're seeing about getting onto the video conferencing platform. Um, most, if not all organizations are including an additional staff member on workshops to assist with technology questions, logistics, and make sure that there's a spotter for safety in case anything goes wrong or anybody needs help. Um, and then in terms of actual access to devices and internet, some organizations are considering purchasing devices for participants to use through a lending library. So this would be a tablet that is available for a participant to use for the duration of a program. Um, during that time, they could also use it to contact friends and family, to you know, read the news online, to do other activities, and maybe learn a little bit more about the um, positives of having uh, a tablet or device like this, uh, and then it's returned at the end of the program. And then another tip is to really provide in-depth training and 
practice sessions for leaders, this is implementing the content in a whole different way uh, than they've been trained to do it before and could take additional time to make sure that they're comfortable doing this. So having patience, having time for leaders to practice and get used to the entirely new process is important, um, both for their confidence in moving forward as well as for retaining participants in the workshop throughout. And I've included some resources here um, for both accessing technology as well as uh, education in this area. So this is an ongoing process. We're continuing to share the, this information, collect, collect best practices from organizations across the country. Um, we've been hosting, uh, they were weekly, they are now monthly grand round webinars to share best practices for lots of different topics like participant registration, uh, virtual delivery platforms, data collection, comfort with, te with technology, training leaders, really any topic to assist in how these programs are implemented remotely. You could view the recordings at the link here that cover a wide range of topics and you could also register to attend future monthly webinars talking about these best practices. We also have several frequently asked questions documents uh, that you could find at the links on this slide that talk about generally implementing these programs remotely as well as specifically data collection and management processes during COVID-19. And this is ongoing. We're continuing to learn from everybody across the country that's doing this. We're continuing to um, collect and share back out resources that are developed to make it easier. Um, and we look forward to continuing to be in touch with all of you on how we could all make these uh, programs even better moving forward. And so I'm really excited to turn over the presentation to Tane Lewis, the evidence-based program coordinator at the Mid-America Regional Council. As you can see, the National Council on Aging has been an invaluable partner and leader to organizations across the country facing this challenge. I'm going to delve into the logistics of administration and the lessons that we have learned about managing virtual evidence-based programs at the state and regional network level. I will begin by providing a brief overview of Missouri's MA4 network. In response to the changing healthcare environment and a national shift towards value-based care, the Missouri Association of Area Agencies on Aging, MA4, created the MA4 network. This network is a statewide integrated contractually based system of Missouri's participating AAAs designed to deliver coordinated evidence-based programming with the mission of helping our community members better manage their chronic health conditions, reduce the cost of care, and improve their quality of life. The network allows for statewide access to evidence-based programs through strong regional networks led by participating AAAs. The network provides central administration, training, and quality oversight through a network hub. MA4 applied for and received a three-year federal grant from the Administration for Community Living to aid MA4 in building the infrastructure needed to increase our capacity to deliver chronic disease self-management education courses across the state of Missouri and to sustain the workshops going forward. The grant began in, in July of 2018. Next slide. This slide provides a visual representation of the MA4 network. The network hub is the control center for the MA4 network. The hub provides centralized program administration, program oversight, reimbursement to our partners, re reporting and data management for our funders, as well as quality assurance for the statewide network. Next slide. The organization that I work for, like James, is Mid-America Regional Council, MARC, which operates the Greater Kansas City Region's Area Agency on Aging. As a participating AAA in the MA4 network, MARC subcontracts with several local community-based organizations to deliver 
evidence-based programs broadly in the community. This slide just provides a visual representation of our regional network up to this point. We're currently in the process of adding additional partners to meet the demands of our third-party funders. Mark's regional network of community-based organizations have come together to provide evidence-based programs in our communities to help support our participants' self-efficacy, health outcomes, and overall satisfaction. Since we began strengthening our network in 2018, our team has increased the reach of evidence-based programs in our communities by over 400%. I am thrilled to say that nearly all of our regional partners are able to, were able to get up to speed and are currently offering virtual and remote evidence-based programs throughout the region. Next slide. When the coronavirus came to our shores and stay-at-home orders were put in place, our regional and statewide networks had to cancel or postpone all of our in-person workshops, as so many organizations were forced to do. Once we recognized that we were not going to be able to meet in congregate settings for an indefinite amount of time, and the impacts of social isolation became evident, we began investigating evidence-based programs that we could offer virtually. The National Council on Aging launched the forum um, that's uh, Grand Rounds that Katie will describe in detail when she is able to rejoin us. Um, and the program developers around the country and facilitators were able to meet and discuss next steps in that forum. Thankfully, Evidence-based program developers and licensing organizations responded rapidly to the need for virtual delivery and began adapting their programs to online and remote formats. We all quickly became students of virtual platforms. As a regional administrative hub, Mark's role was to communicate with our regional partners, disseminate guidance from the MA4 network and various licensing agencies to all facilitators and begin training them to deliver the programs virtually. Initially, we had to determine the level of technical assistance each partner would need to transition and to provide them the support required. So we began convening virtual meetings with our partners and facilitators. The collaboration was very productive and everyone contributed valuable feedback and expertise. Luckily, we found that several facilitators and partners already had significant technological acumen and access to virtual platforms. They generously offered to partner with others who did not have that skill and expertise to help us move forward quickly. Some even provided virtual demonstrations and or allowed less experienced facilitators to sit in and observe their workshops to bolster their confidence in facilitating programs virtually themselves. Next slide. After initial discussions with our partners, we determined that our region had the capacity to offer the following evidence-based programs virtually. The Aging Mastery Program, Aging Mastery Program for Caregivers, Chronic Disease Self-Management Education Programs, Tai Chi for arthritis, and walk with ease. Next slide. This slide provides an overview of the individual self-management resource center programs offered within the chronic disease self-management education suite that our regional network has the capacity to offer virtually. They include better, building better caregivers, chronic disease self-management program, Workplace CDSMP, Tamondo, Chronic Pain Self-Management Program, and Diabetes Self-Management Program. Next slide. Throughout the months of April, May, and June, the MA4 Network Hub team convened several work groups to construct guidance for our partners and facilitators. This slide shows the areas that we focused on as an administrative hub that proved to be effective. First, facilitator training. And the Network Hub has and will continue to cover the cost of training if required by program developers and assist facilitators in acquiring that training. 
The Network Hub distributes leader manuals, books, and any other required supplies as needed as well. We also provide centralized access to virtual workshop materials and guidance so that facilitators have a single place to gather the resources they need to successfully deliver virtual programs. Our virtual programming work group created a virtual program delivery checklist to give direction to facilitators and ensure fidelity is maintained. The checklist comprises of guidance for the following areas. Pre-workshop planning, including participant registration and recruitment, steps to take prior to the first workshop session, and pre-planning between co-leaders, including determining whether participants have the capacity to attend online workshops or whether they are better suited for teleconference op options. The checklist also covers participant management during and between workshop sessions, post-workshop activity, including post-workshop surveys, and distribution of certificates of completion. The checklist details the materials required for delivery of each evidence-based program, including books, CDs, MP3s, MP4s, if, if provided by um, program developers, and handouts. It also covers the delivery of a zero session or introduction to online programs. It covers technology and platform utilization for desktop, tablet, or phone participation, and post-workshop wrap-up, including handling of required workshop paperwork and storage of paperwork in a HIPAA secure manner. I see that a few people are asking about the checklist in the chat, and um, you can contact me uh, after the workshop, and I can talk to you about um, providing some of that guidance to you. Um, my Our project director did not want us to put it on the uh, webinar just to be pulled down from anybody, just because it's proprietary information, but be glad to talk to you about it. So the next thing that we did was we developed an emergency and crisis management plan for virtual programs. And it establishes policies, procedures, and guidelines for responding to a crisis or emergency that could threaten the health, safety, and participation of those attending a virtual workshop or training event. It provides emergency phone numbers and resources for facilitators to access quickly in a crisis. It includes an incident report, an emergency and crisis plan decision tree for facilitators to follow, and example scenarios that might arise. We have made this crisis plan available to you in the webinar as a handout, and you can just click on that and you're able to download it here. I'll also note that we adapted this from an in-person crisis plan that the MA4 network modeled off of the crisis plan developed by Better Choices, Better Health, South Dakota State University. In addition, the MA4 Network Hub team provides ongoing support and guidance to facilitators and administrators within our network, including technical assistance with virtual platforms, reporting, access to our centralized database, and navigating training barriers. We also provide feedback, coordination, and reminders to assist facilitators in maintaining their certification requirements. The MA4 network also maintains quality assurance through fidelity checks, including observation of virtual program delivery and facilitator performance, peer leader evaluations, monthly network partner conference calls, annual audits, and internal tracking. Our next steps include addressing barriers that exist to virtual participation. We are all navigating new territory, and as many of you know, it can be difficult to recruit participants remotely. We're gathering data on the best practices of our network partners and sharing tips and guidance across the network. Lastly, I just wanna point out that this transition to virtual and remote programming has a silver lining. So many in our communities have not been able to attend in-person workshops in the past, for various reasons, including being homebound or lacking transportation. Being able to offer these wellness programs remotely alleviates some of the barriers that factor into social determinants of health, and that represents great progress. 
Missouri will continue to offer these programs virtually long after the pandemic ceases to make meeting in congregate settings a risk to our most vulnerable community members. As one of our community partners so aptly stated recently, we will continue to fumble forward. All right, so now, is Katie able to come back or do you want me to move to Victoria, James? Um, let's go to Victoria next and we'll have uh, Katie uh, clean up at the end and hopefully her connection will be improved at that time. Okay, great. All right. So as one of Mark's regional network partners, Victoria, who is a fantastic leader and master trainer, will now share how parks and recreation are involved in facilitating evidence-based programs, their partnership with Mark, and their experiences with delivering virtual trainings and workshops. Thank you. Thanks, Tane. I'm very happy to be with you all today and to talk a little bit about our organization's experience with delivering um, virtual programs to our community. So I am with Liberty Parks and Rec and Liberty Parks and Rec serves Liberty, Missouri. Our mission is to create community connections and we believe that providing the highest quality parks, programs, services, and facilities is essential to both a prosperous and a healthy community. And this mission was influenced as well as the overall direction of our organization by the National Recreation and Park Association's three pillar model in parks and recreation. As you can see here, the three pillars within that model are conservation, health and wellness, and social equity. But within the health and wellness pillar specifically, parks and rec professionals are recognized as being leaders in improving and enhancing the health and wellness of their respective communities by being actively engaged in reducing obesity, physical inactivity, and even poor nutrition. Next slide, please. So in line with this model and an effort to continue to build and support a healthy community, Liberty Parks and Rec became one of four community partners that you see here to form the Liberty Community Health Action Team or LCHAT in 2013. And this coalition strives to create a community where healthy behaviors are both the easy and preferred choice by making community improvements in three key performance areas. Next slide, please. Moving forward in 2018, the Liberty Parks and Rec Health and Wellness Division was awarded instructor training grants from NRPA, which provided funds to support training two facilitators in Walk With Ease, Fit and Strong, and Active Living Every Day. And then again in 2019, the Health and Wellness Division was awarded the Healthy Aging and Parks Integrating Healthy Communities grant from NRPA. Under this grant, we were able to work together with the Liberty Hospital as part of the NRPA evidence-based physical activity pilot program, which included a point of care referral process for patients of seven Liberty Hospital clinics to our evidence-based wellness program offerings. Next slide, please. Also in 2019, our partnership with the Liberty Silver Center led us into a relationship with the Mid-America Regional Council, or MARC, who has supported facilitator trainings that have allowed us to begin, begin offering several of SMRC's self-management programs, as well as the Aging Mastery Program. And the addition of these programs has really dramatically expanded the capacity of both our evidence-based programs, but also our community-based health and wellness programs. In addition though, to expanding our capacity, really Mark has provided our organization with the opportunity to have more program sustainability than we have had in the past. If we wanted to provide programs to our community in the past and keep those programs free of charge, we actually, as an organization, had to absorb any costs associated with offering those programs, and that included staffing costs as well as the cost of materials. But Mark actually provides program materials and a per completer reimbursement that allows us to cover our costs to offer the program, and thus we're able to keep these programs free for our community. 
And this really is impactful because we know that in some instances in the past, charging a registration fee for our programs has created a barrier for interested participants that might have benefited from taking our programs. And our partnership with Mark has allowed us to completely eliminate registration fees as a barrier. Next slide, please. Currently, we offer all of the programs that you see listed here, but beginning in March of this year, it became apparent um, that as an organization, we needed to pivot and we needed to do so by way of a transition that was both effective and efficient and allowed us to keep our community healthy, connected and engaged. And as we moved through that transition, it became apparent to us that both virtual and remote programming presented itself as being the best way for us to do that. So of the programs that you see listed here, we have the capacity to offer SMRC's chronic disease self-management, chronic pain self-management, diabetes self-management, workplace chronic disease self-management, as well as the Aging Mastery Program and Walk With Ease virtually by Zoom. We're also utilizing the live stream option on Facebook to live stream several of our senior group exercise classes virtually. And this is available to members of our community center, as well as Silver Sneakers members, Active and Fit members, and Prime members. And we stream these classes on a weekly basis in an effort to keep our older adults active, healthy, safe, connected, and also engaged all from the comfort of their own homes. Next slide, please. So as we have transitioned to offering a variety of virtual programs over the last six months or so, we've really learned and adapted and begun to develop some best practices and various innovations in virtual program delivery. Among those, workshop pre-planning and participant management have really stood out as being two of the largest areas in program management where innovation has led us to success both with program implementation as well as providing a pos positive participant experience. In terms of workshop pre-planning specifically, one of the things that we found is most beneficial to consider first is program fidelity, as well as the current guidance from our network hub or our license holder, which is Mark, and program developers. Each of these organizations has really been a guiding force for us in helping our organization begin to develop a plan for virtual delivery. We've also used this guidance to help us work with our IT department to choose a platform that was most appropriate for our organization, as well as that had the tools and security features that we needed for our programs. And then after addressing Fidelity and choosing a platform, we've had the best experience with reviewing responses that we have gotten from our virtual programs request form, where interested participants have told us what programs they're most interested, as well as the time of day that they're available to participate in those programs. And we've used all of those variables together to then establish a timeline with program dates and times, and that, timeline has really been effective in determining a clear sequential process during our pre-planning stages that ends in a great and successful implementation of our workshops in the end. Next slide, please. Whether you're leading a program by yourself or maybe partnering with one or more additional leaders to offer a virtual program, there's often several roles and responsibilities that we have found um, being diligent about one, identifying, but then also two, establishing a staff member that will take the role in handling those various roles and responsibilities is really essential to the delivery of the virtual program itself. So what everyone sees here is a list of many of the things that we found to be most appropriate to consider Consider. Today, though, I do want to spend most of the time that I have with you all considering just a few areas that we found to be most crucial. So prior to the start of registration for any workshop, we delineate 
which staff member will take the lead in managing participant communications because many times it's participants, um, it's electronic communication that we've used for our programs to support and engage our participants during the time um, that we now have to be physically apart from one another. So that makes this responsibility of participant communications management um, more important as a component in virtual programs than it's ever been in in-person programs. Because of this, we've also, um, in an effort to decrease confusion on the participants part, we have one staff member who sends all participant communications, regardless of if multiple staff members may have collaborated and contributed to the communication itself before it was distributed. This allows um, participants the opportunity to know that they their communications for this program will come from one person and has eliminated a lot of confusion um, that participants have experienced in the past um, when they have to get stuck with the task of identifying what communications came from what staff member and who they need to communicate with. Um, we've also found that in our virtual workshops, participants also like to communicate with us when they may not be able to attend a class because they have a conflict and having one staff member that they know is handling communications makes that process much more um, quick and less burdensome on the participants. Another aspect that we have found is really important in um, virtual program delivery is how well each leader can actually navigate and use the platform themselves. So because of this, we ask our leaders to spend some time getting to know the chosen platform and even giving thought to what device they will use and if that device has the capacity to allow them to do things like share their screen to show content and even um, for safety reasons, see all of the participants on one screen. We, again, we also determine whether our leaders have a reliable internet connection that they can use throughout the program. And then once we've addressed those um, variables and maybe done some troubleshooting, even some, some mentoring in some cases, we hold at least one virtual practice session prior to the start of any new workshop. This is because for many of us, Teaching virtually is really a new skill and the virtual world can change so fast. So holding at least one virtual practice session where leaders can help kind of work out the kinks with one another when it um, comes to doing different tech practices like brainstorms or breakout rooms, problem solving, that kind of thing, really we found to be very beneficial for all of the leaders involved. This is also a great time to review our crisis plan together and discuss how we might manage different situations and scenarios that come up throughout the workshop very effectively and efficiently. So in summary, the main idea here really is that having a concrete plan prior to the start of a program and assigning staff to take the lead in various roles and responsibilities allows for ease of participant management, which is where we're going next as well as the ability to troubleshoot problems very quickly and effectively when they arise. And that's particularly the case in a virtual platform. Next slide, please. Participant management. It's really been our experience that how well we've been able to effectively engage and manage participants on our virtual platform has a big impact on whether or not they will continue to show up to our classes week after week. So we have spent a lot of time at our organization trying to decipher what effective participant management looks like. We definitely try to get a hold ahead of the game by helping participants start to learn and feel comfortable with the virtual platform. And we do this by distributing a um, tutorial document that participants can read through before we even have our first zero session. And NCOA has done a really good job at providing um, resources for a virtual platform tutorial that we have been able to adapt to our organization's individual needs. We also hold a general introduction to virtual workshops zero session intended to give participants the opportunity to practice for what 
for some, what can be a new skill like muting and unmuting themselves, raising their hand, turning their video on and off and more. But most importantly, this intro to virtual workshops zero session lets participants practice these skills in a low pressure environment before we start to deliver program content. And that can help to build their confidence and even reduce some apprehension that they might be feeling if they're new to virtual classes. We oftentimes during this intro to virtual workshops also take the opportunity to talk about what device they're using and the differences in location of what they might see on their screen based on the device that they're using. In terms of program material distribution itself, we found that it's best to make arrangements um, based not only on the participants comfort level, but also on what's most convenient for them. And because of this, we offer both a drive through and a mailing option for program materials. We do our best to also utilize mailed incentives throughout the workshops as one method of participant engagement. We found that virtual programs also tend to be heavier in support and engagement. For some reason, we don't have to get dressed and leave the house um, and make a plan to arrive at a specified location at a certain time. It's been really easy for participants to kick their feet up, kick back and relax and not come to class at all. They tend to disengage a little bit. So we like to engage participants by sending weekly reminders with the link to our virtual workshops and facilitator contact information. And this brings the virtual link to the top of their inbox and really starts to put the workshop back on the forefront of their mind each week. We also love to log in early and connect with participants in casual discussion. The participants really appreciate this and it gives them the opportunity to connect and engage in a way that they may have been missing out on, on over the last several months. Us utilizing breakout rooms is another great way to encourage participants to actually interact and connect with each other while they work together during the workshops. And we have found that often participants themselves feel that these breakout rooms allow them to connect in a way that's not possible in in-person workshops. And from a facilitator standpoint, we begin to, the class begins to open up more than they did the first few weeks of the program. As we move into the second half of the program, they've had the opportunity to work with several different participants and it really just changes the class dynamic. The class becomes more engaged, interactive and connected. And that is a great atmosphere to teach in. We've also found that frequent breaks, even if they're short and sweet, have, um, they have the opportunity to bring participants focus back to class and keep them engaged. We rely on check-ins by phone um, as a crucial way to um, give participants a little bit of extra support and encouragement, especially if we've noticed that one of the participants has missed multiple classes in a row. And last but not least, really participant safety has, is always a top priority. Um, so if the program involves a component of physical activity, we encourage our leaders to have their crisis planned on hand and emergency contact information available for each participant in the workshop every time that they're teaching class. Next slide, please. So the virtual experience for us, um, virtual programming, it's a new frontier. So after each workshop, we have asked participants to tell us how we did. We asked questions that were related to the virtual experience specifically. Some examples being, um, we've asked them, what did you think about the virtual experience? What did you like most? What would you change? Um, how can we continue to improve even? But in addition to this, what I want to highlight here is that as part of our survey, we also asked participants what they could see themselves using Zoom to do in the future. And all participants who returned the survey indicated that they could see themselves using Zoom to keep in touch with family and friends. Even the participants who indicated that they had never used Zoom prior to taking one of our workshops said that they could see themselves continuing to use Zoom, and that's a big deal. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more here in a second, but first I do want to share some personal feedback that we've gotten from participants. So next slide, please.
This slide highlights just a few of the personal feedback that we've gotten from participants participating in our virtual programs, and they're just incredibly heartwarming because this feedback that you see here has actually come from those very participants that I've described previously earlier in the presentation as struggling in the beginning with building enough confidence to participate. And in some instances, these are those same participants who might have also just needed a little bit of extra support along the way. So it's really this participant feedback that we've gotten that's really revealed to us the real and positive impact that virtual programming is having for members right here in our own community. Next slide, please. To conclude, I just have some final thoughts and takeaways on the impact of virtual program delivery and, and really what it's doing in our community. So it's no secret. I think we, um, we all know that digital literacy can be a barrier for some adults, but we can also agree that technology isn't going away either, it's here to stay. So in my opinion, these virtual programs are having a bigger impact. And here's where I, where I wanna reference again, the fact that all of the participants who have given feedback on our programs have indicated that they would use technology to connect with family and friends in the future. For me, that is very exciting because it just shows that virtual programming might not only be impacting a participant's quality of life, health, and wellness, it's also potentially lowering digital literacy as a barrier for some participants, which in turn might be helping them develop a skill set or a tool set that will allow them to connect with family and friends in ways that they may have never been able to do before taking a virtual program. These programs are also creating opportunities for us to reach a subset of our community that we didn't have the capacity to reach before because they were homebound. And it's been wonderful having the opportunity to expand the avenues that those who are homebound have to connect and engage with those around them. Additionally, in the area of collaboration and partnership, I can't say enough about the increased opportunities that our organization has had not only to collaborate, but to learn from other organizations as we have pursued similar goals over the past six months or so. And I don't think that we could have made this transition into virtual programming as quickly as we did without having those opportunities for support and collaboration. And for our organization, um, unique to us, we are also housed in a very active community center, and that can make it challenging sometimes to reserve physical space that's not already being used. So moving virtual has actually allowed us to expand our capacity which means that we can offer even more classes to the community. So as a final note, I will say that in my experience with virtual programming, both as a facilitator and a, an administrator, it's really been an amazing and incredibly rewarding experience. And I can truly say that as an organization, we are incredibly excited about um, where innovations and virtual program delivery will take us in the future. Thank you so much for that great information and a great response uh, to this crisis and unprecedented uh, situation. We are going to now to, uh, move to a few questions. And actually, I'm going to start off with one to you, Katie. Uh, people saw that flyer. They saw some of the material that you uh, mentioned, and they started to covet it. Um, can they access <laughs> perhaps some of that information and materials at some centralized website or resource that NCOA hosts? Yes. Yes, so we have examples of resources that have been developed by organizations across the country on our website. So um, the first stop I would recommend is the program tracking page that's linked throughout this presentation and also in the handout that's attached to this webinar. Um, from there, you could really access links to many different resources that we have as, as examples from other organizations. Great, thank you, Katie. Uh, now, Victoria and Tane, uh, we've had a lot of questions about just what is that crisis plan, and can you walk us through uh, what that kind of looks like, when you might enact that crisis plan, and what type of scenarios might lead to it? Okay, this is Tane. I'll jump in there. Um, well, 
you can download the crisis plan and it walks you through it, but, um, and we included scenarios, so possible situations that might occur that would warrant use of the crisis plan. Um, oops, I guess they want me on camera. Here I go. <laughs> okay, so um, as you'll see in that crisis plan, those scenarios are, are really kind of wide you know, we covered a lot of areas. So um, if somebody, for instance, were to have heart trouble or fall out of their chair when they're doing an exercise um, or any other crisis that you can imagine that would come up, um, it has a really nice, clear decision tree in it. So it kind of just walks you through what to do in the different scenarios and how to respond. We gather emergency contact information for every participant prior to the workshop, and the leaders have those on hand. So, you know, if it's not an uh, emergency that requires EMS, then we would contact the your emergency contact um, to see if we could get them to help intervene. Um, doing this virtually is, you know, new to all of us, and it's it can be nerve-wracking um, because of that. We can't actually get there to help the person ourselves, so we we have to utilize their emergency contacts to assist with that. Um, if you have any further questions after reading through the crisis plan, you can feel free to contact me um, or any of us, and and we can you know add additional answers for those questions. Is there something other specific you wanted me to answer? No, I think that's great, Tane. Thank you. Um, so Victoria, you know you've had a lot of experience with older people working with them face to face to get them enrolled. Um, can you give us any particular tips about the platforms that they're most comfortable with, um, how you walk them through that process on an individual basis, and anything else on the human level that makes this easier to transition to virtual? Um, I will say that I have, in all of the workshops we've conducted virtually so far, been pleasantly surprised with how quickly our older adults come up to speed. And I think that um, they are incredibly capable when they have the resources. So I think um, really trying to give them support documents and offer time and guidance that zero session is really helpful. Um, just helping participants troubleshoot and figure out where things are without the distraction of delivering program content. So that zero session is devoted completely to breaking the ice, building confidence, reducing apprehension. Um, and they have had the opportunity to review some documents prior to that that are tutorial like we use zoom primarily for our evidence-based programs so that's the platform that i have the most experience with but i will say that our older adults are very capable so i think that um, as long as they have the support and encouragement they can probably um, come up to speed pretty quickly with almost any platform yeah, and I'll add too that um, we found several of the participants already had some basic knowledge because of the coronavirus. So they've been having family meetings on Zoom and and doing you know parties, and even some of them are still working, and so they're working online. So I was surprised to find the number of folks that already were fa fairly familiar. So you might be surprised at their acumen. Great, thank you both. Uh, you know, so it's one thing to have folks in a classroom uh, giving them this information coming each week to your site, but now we're we're on the, a camera in a home. So are people engaged? If you have a break, are they going to walk out of the room and not come back? How does it work uh, for them? Are, are they they're still learning and still is still present? We don't give them that long of a break. <laughs> Yes, um, we, I mean, we're on, we're interacting with participants during these short breaks. Um, some of the programs, they actually have breaks built in. So the participants aren't allowed to stray too far. Um, and, you know, even they're usually within reach of the computer. So we're still talking and engaging. It's really just a mental break that allows everyone to really refocus, leaders included. It's very nice to have the opportunity to mentally reset. Um, it's, uh, I think the virtual platforms are a little bit harder um, as far as attention span sometimes to, um, to really stay focused and digest the information that you're getting. So those breaks are great. 
Yeah, and they can get up and stretch and things like that. You get tired of sitting looking at the computer, so or phone. So, We've had a lot of phone participants, and that's been really fun because you can see well, them walk. They're walking around their garden or <laughs> something like that, showing us their surroundings, and that's pretty neat. Thank you both. That's great. Um, so, and this one might be for Katie, but any of the, the presenters, please feel free. Are you aware of any programming that's kind of not related to health? We've been talking a lot about the SMRC programming, um, that really standardized evidence-based programming. Are you aware of any other programming that shifted to virtual that's kind of more general for older people that you could discuss? Oh, sure. Yeah, I think there's been tons of programming that shifted to virtual and through our National Institute for Senior Centers, we've heard about uh, just about every activity that uh, has been posted at senior centers being moved to virtual options in various communities. So we've heard of book clubs, um, and, you know, different chatting groups uh, to get on and socialize by phone or video conference. Uh, we've heard uh, about extensive social calls programs, so the opportunity to check in weekly and make sure that uh, people both have the um, the things that they need, but also that they have an opportunity to connect with others in their community. Um, so yeah, I think there are lots of options, especially once the skills are established to join something like a video conference or join by phone um, to be able to do a lot of different activities. Yeah, and I'd, I'd add that one of our partners is doing a drive-through mental health checkup that's pretty neat. So actually, I think they're in collaboration, two different partners working together, um, and folks can just drive up to the to the location that they've designated and get a get a mental health checkup with a professional. So that's been pretty neat. And then um, also our uh, university extension folks have a lot of other programs that are like mindfulness and uh, mind games, different things like that, that help engage folks. Um, and then I would also say Parks and Rec has a, additional programs that, sure, it's exercise and fitness, um, and that's related to health, but I think those programs seem to get the greatest participation. Folks really need an outlet for exercise and physical activity that, that they can't get um, very well when they're isolating. So those are great programs. Thank you. So now shifting gears a little bit to the pipeline of older people that are entering these uh, programs and classes, um, have you considered or heard of any partnerships between uh, pre-hospital providers, EMS, fire departments, or emergency department staff to make referrals into these uh, courses? It seems they'd be vulnerable and really benefit from them. Katie, do you, I have um, spoken, we've, our team has spoken a little bit with the uh, fire you know, fire teams about that because of that. They do a lot of wellness checks. Um, and so we have not been, a, we haven't contracted with anybody yet at this point, but there has been discussions and a lot of interest. Um, so hopefully going forward, we'll be able to do some of those connections. And I think those would be great. Yeah, now there's a lot definitely. of, oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, we've heard of uh, lots of opportunity around partnering with EMS services, particularly around falls prevention programs. So referral systems have been set up to uh, receive contact information for individuals who may have called emergency services after a fall. Um, and then at a later date, uh, the community-based organization that's offering services can follow up, provide information on falls prevention or other services. Uh, and perhaps engage them in an evidence-based program. Uh, so that's one example, but definitely even more opportunity now as general wellness checks are happening. Great, thank you. So there's been a lot of uh, talk in the uh, question board about different platforms, and there are quite a few people uh, interested in Facebook as a platform for engagement. Uh, can any of you comment on any efforts that you've heard about on Facebook? I've heard of them doing uh, the chronic disease self-management suite uh, programs on Facebook Live. So that's a possibility as long as you really protect people's privacy. Um, there's nothing really that would stop you from doing it that way. And there's another, uh, another line of questioning around um, how people are experiencing completer rates. That's, a, that's an outcome for most of these courses. Can you really get the same completer rates with virtual as you can with in-person? 
It depends on the program. Um, we have some, I would say, uh, one of our partners talked a lot about their Tai Chi programs getting really good participation rates. Um, yoga programs, like I said, the exercise programs seem to be of great interest. Um, I will say that some of our online, you know, chronic disease programs and um, AMP have done very well. And then a few, some of them have had a harder time. So it just kind of depends on the group that you have and your leaders. I always, ex, always, always <laughs> emphasize how important it is for leaders to be engaging and enthusiastic because that's how you're going to keep your participants coming back every week. So that's just, it's just vital. It's the most important piece. Um, otherwise, yes, we have seen a decrease. I'm not going to lie about that. There have been dropouts of the programs from people that were frustrated by the platform. Um, and then also recruitment has been a struggle, but we're getting there. We're learning. We're learning every day. And so, Katie, uh, and would, from a COA's perspective, what is the completer rate like at the national level? Yeah, so right now we're just starting, as I showed in that graph, to get data in on the remote workshop. So it's still limited and could certainly change moving forward. But so far, we're actually seeing a slightly higher completer rate across the country. Um, and of course, you know, everything is on a bell curve. So there's going to be circumstances where this, you know, does not work very well in some circumstances and uh, others where people take to it really strongly. Um, but right now at the national level, there's a slightly higher completer rate. And we're also seeing that with programs that have traditionally had a, a lower completer rate where it's hard to get people to commit to coming to programs that, you know, may last for 12 or 16 weeks. Um, and it's a little bit more feasible to do that, it seems, when it's being offered remotely. Yeah, that makes a right. lot of sense. Also, I'd, I'd say some of the time in the past, um, the barrier to coming to an in-person in program would be maybe if somebody has chronic pain or a flare-up in their chronic condition that makes it hard for them to come to class, they can jump online and do it that way. And so I agree, it's an opportunity. Yeah, and we've heard that affects the chronic pain self-management program um, that, uh, just like Tana saying, it's more feasible uh, if symptoms are really difficult that day to be able to do it from your, your living room rather than going out. In our informal uh, question box poll, it looks like most respondents are saying that their uh, completer rates are increasing on virtual platforms and uh, one one individual says that it's because you know they don't need transportation to the sessions. That's always challenging, and they get a, a, a reminder for each session, which is another thing you can more easily do on virtual mm -hmm. platforms. Um, now, what about uh, referral into these systems uh, from healthcare providers? You know that might be one way to increase the number of completers moving into these systems. Is there a HIPAA compliant mm -hmm. process, or do we need to go back to 1980 and the fax machine? <laughs> Now, James, you could answer that question. <laughs> Absolutely, HIPAA compliance is required. If you're having any health funder, any third party funder, you become under that umbrella of HIPAA compliance and you will be in big, big trouble <laughs> and with big fines if you do not use a HIPAA compliant method. And so, what are you talking about? A social health referral platform like Aunt Bertha Healthify or a secure email? What do you use? Well, you can use that system or you can use an FTP process or you can set up an encrypted email system, whatever's going to work for your funder. We do what the we, we, we do what the funders want, don't we? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, we're wondering now, uh, have any of you had experience with people who have used the telephone method for connecting? You know, uh, we can do as much as we want. We can hope that Apple will email out iPhones to every person 65 and older with an unlimited data plan, which they should do. But for those who have to use their home phone, have you had experience or heard about that? And how does it go? For yeah, I actually jotted that down as a question that needed to be answered. Um, and I don't, if you're aware, most of these programs and particularly the ones that we're supporting 
do offer a teleconference version. So they can either um, get on the phone and, and join an online program with AMP. AMP allows for that. Um, with chronic disease, you can't do that. You have to separate it out between virtual programs and a teleconference program, and they call those toolkits. And so you mail a toolkit to the participant who gets a self-directed kind of guidance on how to manage that and then you do check-in calls once a week and you just go through their action plans and make sure they don't have any questions and help with any of that self-guided tour piece of it um, so each program is a little bit different on how they manage it but most of them are adapting and, and allowing some teleconference um, capacities so that helps a lot for the folks that can't get on the internet Great, thanks, Tane. And so, Victoria, I kind of want to hear from you about at, in the City of Liberty, what what would you hope could be the one lasting impact of this crisis on how you offer programming to your community? Um, I I would love to continue to offer the virtual programs um, and. As I mentioned, it, it has allowed us to reach a subset of our community that we never had the opportunity to reach, and they now have ways to connect with the world around them that they never had before. Um, so I, I want to continue to build on that and create opportunities for those that are homebound to have the same um, access to resources than um, as you know everyone else and we do have a transportation system here in Liberty um, that are that's provided by the community center for um, members of our community to go to doctor's appointments in the store and that kind of thing but I just find that those that struggle with chronic pain and, and really mobility in general can really benefit. So I just really hope that um, we continue to reach that subset of our population. That's been really exciting um, to see those individuals connect. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, so now I kind of want to hear from each presenter. If, if you had one thing you really wanted the audience to take home from today's session, um, remember and or implement in their setting, what would that be? Let's start with you, Katie. Sure, thanks, James. Um, you know, I think that something I personally have learned through all of this, I tend to be a, a type A uh, type of person where I want everything to be planned, laid out, have, uh, you know, a whole projection of how things will go. And I think in this situation, um, in March, April, we just had to like try things and maybe it wasn't perfect. Maybe we ran into some hiccups as we did today. Um, maybe there are things that we've learned just in this first seven months that have needed to change, um, but we're much farther along than if we had waited to realize, like, this is something that is going to stay. This is something that we're going to have to do no matter what. Um, and so sometimes it's better to jump in, learn as we go. And I think we've accomplished so, so much collectively in the last seven months that we could have you know, never predicted had this not happened. Totally agree. Uh, Tane, what about you? What's that one takeaway that you want people to have? Well, I actually have two. I can't help it because I want to reiterate what uh, Katie just said. And, and I just I think all of us as program facilitators, administrators need to be flexible and creative and realize that this is new territory. The canvas is blank and we can create. So this is a this is an opportunity for innovation that we haven't had in a long time. So I'm really excited about the opportunities and the ideas and input that everybody can provide to make this a better experience for our participants. The second thing I just want to remind everybody is that our folks are that we serve have a lot more capability than sometimes we think they do so i think we go in thinking that they're not gonna you know be able to manage some of this stuff and as victoria said and and katie and i both mentioned um our participants have gotten up to speed quickly and they are really enjoying it and the interaction is really nice i think the the online face it, maybe it's the fact that your face is on Zoom when you're doing that, and it's it, the participation actually has gone up a little bit, been a little bit more rich, because they're not in a room where they're sitting at the back and and can get away with not answering. They think everybody's looking at them because they're video, videos on the screen, and they feel the compelled to answer questions. Um, so yeah, just be really be really open to the idea uh, that your that your folks are going to be very very 
technologically savvy quickly. Um, James, real quick though, um, we did not get to cover the question about the virtual programming checklist. And I wanted to make sure that that is covered because that was an asked and I answered in a way that I need to walk back because I spoke with our project director and she said that she will we will be able to post the virtual programming checklist to our website after we confer with all of our work group partners and add credit to their organizations for their contributions. So once we've added that, we've created the PDF for you, it'll be up on the site and she's working on that as we speak. So it should be done very quickly and ready for you guys. All right, so, so it's a Victoria's turn. <laughs> Go ahead, Victoria. Oh, so one thing um, I really, I think that Tane and Katie have done a really good job at explaining um, the fact that we have made leaps and bounds very quickly and that a lot of it is because we've had the opportunity to collaborate together and partner uh, and working towards like goals and a lot of times organizations aren't necessarily working towards like goals but this pandemic has created a situation where a lot of us are working towards similar goals and objectives and we have um use that to our advantage and progress really quickly. So I have been very excited about having the opportunity to learn from other organizations and to collaborate and partner. And I am also um, incredibly excited about lowering digital li literacy as a barrier for our participants. I, th I really do think that our vir virtual programs have a much bigger impact. And I think that if we take a step back to look at the bigger picture, um, we can really start to connect the dots and draw some um, some conclusions from um, the programs and the impacts that they're having. So I just can't wait to learn more and um, and to really see this method of um, program delivery continue to flourish. Wonderful sentiments. Uh, thank you all to our presenters um, and to our attendees today. Uh, we've really had a lot of fun and hope that you've uh, learned something and taken away some silver linings from this emergency situation. Uh, that will conclude our presentation today, and the materials uh, from the webinar, including the recording, will be forthcoming afterwards.